today's session is about how do we think about and practically verify visual content online. This is, oh, I'm going to forget what number of session it is because we've done so many. I think this is session six of our flexible learning course um, vac on vaccine insights. And if you haven't been with us before, that's absolutely not a problem. This course is designed to be able to tune into any of these sessions independently. However, if you want to go back and rewatch some of the previous ones, they're all available on our website as well in English and in all of the different languages. Today's agenda is like this. We're going to look at why visual misinformation is so important and, and think about what the power of images and video is to convey information and therefore why we should be looking for these kinds of content. And this is anchored in research and collaborative projects that we have done in the past. We're gonna talk about the five pillars of verification that underpin how we verify content at first draft. And this is a methodology that we've kind of designed throughout the years of doing this kind of work. And embedded into that will be practical tools and resources for how you can do this kind of work. And all the tools that we're gonna be showing you today are open source and free to access online because price shouldn't be something that prevents you from doing this kind of work. Verifying visual content and content online is kind of a very basic thing that we've been doing at First Draft since we started as a nonprofit verifying what we then called user-generated content. If you haven't been here before and you don't know who I am, my name is Laura Garcia, and I am the training and support manager at First Draft, and you can find me on Twitter at Laura GRB. Let's talk about the power of visual media. So we've mentioned this report before, but um, if you haven't come across it, we did, and when I say we, it's the royal we, my colleagues in the research department at First Draft, looked at an incredibly big data set of posts across different social media platforms about vaccines. Good posts, bad posts, good narratives, bad narratives. And it was published last November and it's called Under the Surface. And in this report, we saw a couple of things. Photos and videos where 51% of all the content that was included in this data set. And this was also really underrepresented because there's um, the way that we were picking which posts to look at was through the words of each post, which meant that if someone, for example, posted a meme about vaccines but never mentioned the word vaccines in the text, then that wouldn't have been picked up by our research, right? There's always limitations when you do this kind of stuff, which means that that 51% figure is actually well under the real volume of how people use images and videos to talk to each other about vaccines and the things that they're concerned about or the questions that they have. And here you have an example on the left hand side um, of a story from World of Buzz that said that an 11 year old girl died after getting vaccinated in school because um, the doctor didn't know that she had a fever. And you can see that it's from Instagram, right? And there's limitations and different challenges to doing research across all of these different platforms. And we'll talk about that in a second. And talking about platforms, there was also a distinct difference in the kinds of content share across different spaces, but throughout the three languages that we analyzed, which was English, Spanish, and French, look at the incidence of Instagram. Instagram is an innately visual platform, right? It's very driven by images and by videos. And even though sometimes people can maybe write a little statement and take a picture of it and post that as a picture on Instagram, most of the content that we see is visual, right? And it takes up quite a bit of the percentage of the content that we analyze across all these three languages, reminding us that this is an important and really powerful way of conveying information. The thing about images as well is that they're very easy when we're all on our phones to screenshot, to download and share and to forward. And that is another reason why images become a really powerful way of sharing messages, whether they're about vaccines or elections or anything that is that we're analyzing. And just to take another example from a project that we've done, this is from the collaborative verification project that we ran in Brazil the last time they had elections called Comprova, where we established a tip line on WhatsApp and just tried, pe tried to ask people to send us any information that they were receiving that they were unsure of so that we could verify it. And it was really, really successful. We got thousands and thousands of tips 
And you can see on the left, you compare by the type of content that people were sending into this tip line so that we could investigate it. Images were by far the most important type of content that people were sending us, which means that images were the biggest volume or the most worrying kind of content that people were receiving, right? Because this was a tip line. So people had to send us or forward us the things that they were getting through their social media channels and spaces. And here are some of the examples of these images. The one on the left is a picture of a ballot box where you keep the votes that people cast on the back of a pickup truck that has not been modified at all. It's a real picture of a ballot box. You can see that it has a timestamp on it and it's from 2015, which is a couple years earlier than when Brazil last had presidential elections. And this single image was the most um, prevalent image that we got sent in throughout this whole project of Comprova and shared with different narratives around it. And granted, this is about elections, but the same thing happens with vaccine and health misinformation. So what is an, a picture of just a box in the back of a pickup truck then got shared with frames of this is what they do with your votes. They don't care. They're transporting them somewhere different. This is evidence of corruption. Attach any labels and problematic narratives that you want around it, right? We also saw a bunch of screenshots. You look on the right hand side. That is just a screenshot or what looks like a screenshot of a conversation on WhatsApp. And that is part of what we should consider as visual content that needs verifying online. We all do it. It's really, really easy to just screenshot something and share it. And we have to remember as well, the platforms that host video as a part of this ecosystem of telling stories through images. This is a story from earlier in this year. So January 27th, YouTube has removed more than 500,000 COVID misinformation videos since February. That means February last year, right? And that is an important fact because if you see it in conjunction with the stat that we have on the right, these are results from a Pew Research Center um, report on how people in the US consume news, but this isn't exclusive to the US. About a quarter of US adults said to the survey that they actually go to YouTube to get their news. And if we think about how for some people in different communities, their phones are the only way that they can interact with the internet. So maybe they don't have a computer at home or now that we're not going to offices, they've lost that access on desktops. And that sometimes news providers are behind a paywall. So I need to pay to access content, for example, by the New York Times, or I need to subscribe to a specific cable package to be able to watch CNN in some countries or other broadcasters. Then what people do is turn to YouTube or turn to Google to find answers that then sends them to YouTube to this kind of content, right? And you can even look further down where they were asked, do you watch YouTube for news or for opinions? And it's pretty much a split halfway down the middle, right? And this will be probably very similar or even higher incidents in different countries from all over the world. I know, for example, it's definitely true in my home country of Mexico. Right, My cousins and my family and everybody shares with each other news reports on YouTube because they're easier to consume on mobile phones than having to, to tune in on television at a specific time. Right, It makes this sharing social. And if we look at it worldwide, just to kind of drive that point home, YouTube is the second most popular social network across the world. It's the second most popular search engine across the world. And it's also localized in a hundred countries. So that means that when you land on YouTube Mexico, for example, your content is catered to that specific audience versus YouTube in the States or YouTube in the UK, right? That second fact that it's the most second most popular search engine is super important because it means that people are using it almost as a way to find answers as a library of information where without thinking about it, they're maybe being falling prey to what the algorithms wants to show them or things that are catered to their previous preferences and all that kind of stuff, right? It's very different asking a librarian for help than typing a question into YouTube. And that is an important part of this dynamic. And here we have a couple of recent examples. So for example, on the right-hand side, this comes from our colleagues in the Australia Bureau of a um, Sydney hotel quarantine worker who tested positive for COVID-19 after getting the vaccine which happens because the vaccines aren't 100% effective or maybe it was after the first dose, but all of that nuance is lost 
when all you do is repost an image. So look at the, this is an Instagram post by Reignite Democracy Australia, that's the account. And it's a screenshot of a news report with a video, which you obviously can't play because it's a screenshot. And then it comes in the comments, take the experiment, they say it's safe, they say it's effective, they say, and it links back to the story, right? But if I'm interacting with this on my Instagram account, probably on my phone, what am I gonna remember? The headline, the image, and the comments, right? And Instagram doesn't display links natively in the comments, which means that I can't even click on that to go and read the original story. I have to copy it, which is really fiddly on a phone, then go and paste it into a browser and go from there, right? Or on the left-hand side, we have an example from Germany. There's been lots of controversy in Germany, overblown, unfounded over the AstraZeneca vaccine and its safety. And you have a man called Martin um, Siehert, a member of the far right alternative party for Germany, sharing a graphic that translates into the yellow bit um, and the human experiment now. Look at the big letters, look at the colors, look at the impact and the emotional effect that that is gonna have on people when they see that on their screens. And that is the power of images, right? The other thing about images and videos is that they're harder to monitor. We don't have that many great tools to identify the content of an image. So when we monitor for content, we, we tend to monitor the words around a post, right? The, the words that people use to describe what they are sharing on social or the comments section under it. They can be really emotive and compelling. Just think of those red letters that we saw in the previous post. And also, if you have a 40 minute video that someone posts on Facebook or that they go live, for example, unless as a journalist or a researcher or someone who monitors this kind of stuff, unless you watch all 40 minutes of it, you're not gonna be able to pick out the bits that are false, right? And it makes it also really difficult to fight with counter messaging, particularly when it comes to live streamed video and those kind of conversations, right? Because once they happened, you've lost that captive audience. And then we have another example from France around the AstraZeneca vaccine, where in a video that was posted, there are a lot of really false claims that they make. And again, unless you, as a fact checker, watch the whole thing and then carefully pick out the bits that need correction, it makes it really hard, right? But in the meantime, people can forward it many times, download to their phone and share in a different platform. And it even starts to lose some of that contextual information of how it was first posted. And even in new spaces like TikTok, this problem can even be worsened by something that we describe as content density, which means how much information you are getting per second of video. And this is determined by the layers of information and understanding that you have in a video, right? So in a normal YouTube video, for example, you have the images, so what you can see, what you can hear, what people are saying, maybe you lay, um, layer some music, or you can use graphics. On TikTok, there are extra layers. For example, you can use a specific sound as a trend. You can use hashtags and descriptions just like on other platforms, but you can also interact with other people's content using a function called Stitch or Duet. And you only have 60 seconds to do it, but it means that if you include cues or bits of information in all of these layers, you can really pack a punch in 60 seconds. And even more because TikTok loops the video until you decide not to watch it anymore. It's not a problem if you didn't get all those layers of meaning the first time you watch the video because you can rewatch it three or four times until your brain has fully understood all of these signals of messaging. And that makes it even more problematic, right? That we have to understand these spaces to know what to look out for. Let's talk about how do we verify it? Now, these pillars of verification should or help, will help drive your investigations, whether you're investigating a picture that has been posted on Instagram, a video on Twitter, or something on TikTok. The questions are meant to drive you through different areas that you can investigate and verify. And let's remember as well that verification doesn't always mean finding out that something is false in the end, right? As journalists and researchers and health communicators, we also want to make sure that the things that we share are true and accurate and we still have to verify them even if we already kind of think that they're true and accurate. So let's talk about these five and the most important one of these is the first one, provenance. Now for all the translators this is a weird word to translate or at least I don't know a perfect equivalent in Spanish but what it means is 
where did it originally come from and can you trace back that journey because how something gets shared can give you a lot of information about the communities that share it and also knowing what the original content was is going to give you a lot more information right and it also speaks to the language in our culture online we share things with each other we forward we remix that's the essence of memes right you take someone's content you add another layer of meaning and then you share it and you forward again so it starts by becoming really skeptical of anything that we encounter online and thinking am i looking at the original if not, can I trace back its provenance to find out the first person or account who posted this content? And what does that journey tell me about this piece of information, right? And then once you've found the original or as close as you can to the original, can you answer more questions about the source? Who or what in, um, account posted it? Can you verify? their identity in different ways. Sometimes it's as easy as um, finding out where someone works and calling up, I was gonna say their office, but no one's in offices anymore, but calling up their place of work and checking if that person actually works there, verifying the date when something was created just because the po I post a picture on Twitter today and say it's from today in London. That doesn't mean that picture is from today in London. How do I look for clues that I can independently verify for the date and the location. And don't worry, we're gonna look at tools and tips for all of these. And the last one is motivation, which is the hardest one to kind of pinpoint specifically, but that gives us an inkling into maybe what are the narratives that this content is being shared into. But the first question you should always have in your mind is that first pillar about provenance. Am I looking at the original? How can I verify that? What will that tell me about this piece of content? And we have a little rubric of how to kind of take you through steps and questions of verifying images and videos as part of our verification essential guide, which you can find on this link, bit.ly verification guide, and will also be on the handout that you get at the end of the week if you've taken part in any of these boot camps. And I'm gonna drive this point home even further about provenance because the importance of finding the original or at least searching for it, performing that search and trying to get to the original source is really important. On the right hand side, we have a video uh, from last summer, last summer, not even summer, <laughs> spring, from last March that was shared, allegedly showing an Italian corona patient escape from hospital. Look at the video where it is, right? What visual clues do we have there? It already looks like the quality isn't great, so maybe it's not the original. It has a layer of text in Arabic, which I've been told translates exactly into an Italian corona patient escape from hospital. Um, and there's all these cues that maybe this is not the original and tracing it back to its source would help us figure that out. Now, if you want to know the true story behind this example, you're going to have to join us to our recap session on Friday, where we will walk you through step by step how we went about verifying this particular video. So join us on Friday. Right. The first and the easiest tool to use is called reverse image search. And there are different search engines that you can use to make a reverse image search. There's Google, Yandex, Bing, a couple of other ones that are walking you through. And it's important to remember that there's more life than Google when doing a reverse image search because each of the algorithms are a little bit different. And sometimes what that means is that you'll find different results and one might have the answer you're looking for. Google has three sections. The first one has pages that include matching images, which is really useful. So for example, this one on the right is a real picture of a politician in San Francisco getting her vaccination. And if you reverse image search that, it shows you pages that are also using that image. So it's a quick way to verify who else has published a story or a post using this particular image. And what does that mean for um, how does it validate the information. It also has, um, oh, this is the same thing. Yeah, so you can see that it goes there, one from the other. It also has a page that says pages that include matching images or very similar images. And now the problem here is that Google's AI has gotten so good or evolved to try to give you what you're looking for 
that the visually similar images section is actually not helpful anymore. Because if you see on the right hand side, this is a picture of um, medical professionals in Kenya waiting to get their vaccination. And if we do a reverse image search on Google, the visually similar images is actually trying to give us other examples of similar situations, but it's not looking for things that visually match the image that I'm looking for. So by trying to be overly helpful, it kind of becomes less helpful to the work that we are doing, right? So it's important to keep that in mind. If we look at Yandex, for example, which is kind of like the Russian version of Google, Yandex is looking for visual cues that are more like the image that we asked it to reverse image search. And this is why it's important to look for and reverse image search across different platforms. Same with Bing, right? And Bing is showing different kinds of results. So doing that and keeping that in mind is really important. Tinai is a website that also does reverse image searching that looks at a smaller data set, but that has two big advantages. One, it's really good with avatars. So like logos and icons that people use or accounts use as their profile images. And it's also really good on mobile. So if you ever need to verify something on the go, then you just go to tinai.com, upload the picture in question and see the results. And that is kind of a big benefit of it. Here, for example, um, we have an account called um, GB Empresa, which is using a whole bunch of different con contradictory hashtags. So one is vaccines work, vaccine injury awareness, vaccines harm actually. So we just reversed image search the logo and found a very similar one that belongs to another organization. Now this in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean anything, but it gives you a place to start looking, right? And our preferred tool is a plugin for Google Chrome called Reverse RevI Reverse Image Search that works for Chrome and for Firefox. And once you have that installed, wherever you are on the internet, whether you're looking at an Instagram post or a tweet or a news story or something on someone's blog, you can just control click or right click and immediately send to either one or all of these search engines to perform that search. And it'll just open up separate tabs for each of them. So this is really useful because you can just do it in the middle of whatever you're doing and then go and compare results. Invid does something very similar for videos because videos are problematic, right? And what Invid does is that it breaks a video that you upload onto it or that you link into Invid and it breaks it up into thumbnails that then you can reverse image search. It also shows basic data associated with the video and it uses um, NLP, which is natural language processing to pick out verification related comments. So let's say you have a tweet with 300 comments. It'll look for comments that say phrases like, this video is fake or this video is not real, which can be really helpful to give you clues of where to look into. And it also has a cool magnifying tool to let you look into a particular piece of content a bit more. Verifying source. Basic questions to ask about sources. I'm just going to go and run through them really quickly, but we have an entire bootcamp dedicated to this coming up on this course that we strongly recommend you join us for because we'll go in through a lot of the tools that we use to verify accounts, right? And people's identity that they say online, that what they are portraying themselves to be online, right? But it looks at the same kind of cues and clues that we're looking at when it comes to images and videos. So the five pillars of verification just adapted. When it comes to date, it's important to keep in mind and don't worry about writing all of this down. This is in the handout you'll get at the end of the week. The time that you see on different social media platforms is sometimes different to the time when something was actually posted. So for example, Facebook will show the time and date in the time zone that you have selected on your device or your computer. So for example, for me, it would show in um, GMT because I live close to London but not in the time zone of the person who posted it, right? And sometimes if you're investigating something from a different country, knowing at what time the original user posted something is really important. So we have this little guide showing the differences between all these platforms and how they display time. Location, we can do something called geolocation, which is looking at visual clues to verify the place of a particular content and always independently verify. On the right, we have an example that um, Shady Nairobani, who is one of my colleagues in the States, designed just to show how easily you can mock up something that looks like it's legit when it really isn't. So this is a picture um, and she put underneath it, Metropolitan Hospital Center, which is a hospital in New York. Um, 
when in reality it's from Connecticut. But on Instagram, you can tag an image like if it's from anywhere in the world and there aren't any filters to doing it. So I could post a picture of my cat right now and say it's in Nairobi, Kenya, and the post would display the location that's Nairobi, Kenya, because that's what the platform lets you do. So always independently verify. And here's the original image, uncropped from Instagram. So it's always important to ask questions and interrogate the location information that we're getting it, right? Can we independently verify? Are there other pictures from that same space? Can we look for clues in the picture or the video to figure out where people um, are or where something was captured, right? Buildings look different in Paris than in Nicaragua. And that is an important kind of clue that we can use to investigate this further. We have an entire essential guide available on our website that is in English, French, Spanish, German, Italian, Portuguese, and Hindi, which you can access on our training page. 